and it was not an effort in college. We certainly had a good uh, law of the press course. It's not all that diff different from what we teach in COM 403 here at Penn State. Uh, but what we have uh, there was no, no uh, formal training uh, in ethics in college uh, in the 50s. That has changed, and I think that even the schools that don't offer standalone courses in ethics as we do, at least integrate uh, ethical issues into their skills course. So I, I think that it, it, uh, what I learned uh, going in was uh, in a, a very general way what our, our, our mission was, uh, but I had to learn from uh, observation and, and trial and error as to a better way to, to, to try to resolve the ethical issues came along. Now, I think we can today look at uh, a, 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 at least guidelines. There's certainly decisions that had to be made and uh, they're not made for us. But if on the question, for example, is when should a journalist put down his or her notebook and help somebody out, uh, the standard we have is that if you're the best person or the only person to save a life or prevent harm, then you should do it. Uh, obviously, uh, you had to make uh, some extrapolations from that, but we didn't have that sort of guideline then. And, you, and if you're faced with a, an instant decision, uh, it's not likely to be as good as if you had been trained in ethics in a more formal way. Yeah. Can you think of specific instances from the 1950s, you know, in Arkansas, where ethics, you know, dilemmas, problems, issues came up and mm -hmm. had to be dealt with? I'm thinking specifically uh, of coverage of, you know, the centerpiece story of yeah. the time period, the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock, but, you know, whether that story or mm -hmm. others around civil rights issues at that time. Right. Six months after I got out of the Army and began officially my uh, newspaper career, uh, the Central High School crisis in September 57 erupted. Uh, I had a cameo role in covering that, but I got to see a lot of the things that were going on, certainly talked to the reporters who had, were encountering problems and uh, 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 a lot of us, you were young reporters and talked to each other. We probably have the best story of our whole lives right here at the beginning. And as far as reporting, that certainly uh, was the case in mind but, uh, because I became an editor and, and uh, uh, didn't cover a lot of stories firsthand after that. But uh, there are two things that happened at Central High School. Uh, where daily, when the National Guard was there, ostensibly to protect, uh, to preserve the peace, but in reality to carry out, uh, say we're gonna have to say, continued segregation to keep the African-American children out of the school, uh, that the, uh, 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 the National Guard uh, allowed a, a mob to form each day. And there was always danger they were gonna get out of control. Uh, and when Elizabeth Eckford, the first of the nine uh, black students who came, and she got, came by herself off the a bus, she had not got the word that we're all going to go together because her family did not have a telephone, and she just didn't get the word. So she was confronted there with the mob and with the guardsmen with their rifles uh, raised against her. And so when she was obvious she was not going to get into the school, she had to walk in front of the high school, which is about two blocks wide, to a bus stop and wait there at the bus stop uh, to be taken away. Uh, and the crowd taunting her in, uh, in danger of getting out of control. Uh, two things, as I say, happened. One was that uh, a CBS cameraman uh, wanted to film uh, white students uh, yelling at her, and, but he missed it. So we asked them to yell at them, her again, which <laughs> obviously an ethical uh, problem. Uh, and, uh, the second thing was that Benny Fine, uh, reporter for the New York Times, uh, saw what was happening to Elizabeth, and he had a, uh, a daughter 15 years old, as Elizabeth was, and he just felt overcome that he had to sit down beside her, put his arm around her and tell her, don't let them see you cry and try to comfort her. Other reporters, uh, you know, without the guidelines we have now, and I mentioned one a minute ago, it certainly didn't meet that guideline. It, it, they uh, kind of moved so they form a, a protective semicircle around her, at least position them between her and the mob in case something did happen. Uh, but they did not feel that they could 
become a part of the story themselves. And in fact, uh, when Fein wrote his story, he did not mention his part in it. So those were two issues. And, and with the guidelines we have today uh, in taking uh, our ethics course, uh, I think our, our students would know not to do what those two journalists did. Another part of the, uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's jump to, to this question, because uh, this is a story that you told on tape in another interview about this. Um, it's also part of the desegregation story that this, um, this guy who was a convicted burglar. Yes. Was, what is it, could you just tell that story? <laughs> well, uh, the, a crisis certainly is not uh, two years long, but we consider the, 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 dem the demarcation of the of the conflagration in Little Rock from the uh, fall of 57 when fall was called out the guard. And, we, and eventually, of course, as we know, Eisenhower sent the federal troops in to uh, escort the children into the school. And uh, so we had a tortured uh, uh, school year. Uh, in 58, 59, fall was closed the high schools in Little Rock to avoid desegregation. And uh, during this time, the uh, moderate people in Little Rock had been intimidated by the segregationists who dominated the uh, public forum. But they decided to start to assert themselves that this is our town, we're not going to let this go on. We want, we want schools and uh, we want, you know, we're accepting desegregation. Uh, so they had an election and, and, uh, and the segregationists tried to recall the three moderate school board members and the moderates tried to recall the three segregationist members. And the, uh, it resulted in an election in which the moderates won. It was a very close election, but it set the, the, the uh, course. Uh, now, with the three segregationists off the board, uh, the moderates decided they would be magnanimous and allow the county judge, who was the administrative officer of the county, uh, to appoint a dead-end segregationist to one member of the board. He would always, or she would always, be vote, outvoted five to one. And uh, so the uh, segregationists nominated somebody and the judge duly appointed it. it uh, before the story was published in our newspaper about this appointment, uh, our reporters quickly found out that this man was a convicted felon, a burglar, was ineligible to vote or to serve on the school board. Uh, so we, we called uh, the county judge and, every, and, the, and the felon about this, saying we're going to be reporting uh, that you're really not eligible. He said. I resigned. Is that a moment where everyone in the newsroom was sort of holding their breath to see what the editor was going to yeah, do? I don't think that? anybody really what thought that thinking? Harry would uh, would do it any other way, yeah. and it certainly gratified that it, he it made the decision. I think that his, his the way he uh, immediately just rejected the idea was was very uh, comforting to all of us. That, that, you know, this is the guy who knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other characters who? Um, you know, served as mentors to you in that way and, you know, making the tough decisions and, you know, setting an example, this is how it's done? Yeah, I, uh, the people I've worked for uh, over my career, by and large, been people have been good mentors in, in, in uh, private conversations with them. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, I thought, were the most effective. And uh, I was, when early uh, in my career, became assistant city editor Bill Shelton, I was the uh, city editor at the Gazette in Little Rock, uh, who directed the Central High coverage. And uh, well, as a reporter, I found him fairly aloof and, and hard to get to know. Uh, working side by side with him, uh, he, I found him to be a very good teacher. Uh, and he would explain to me decisions that, that if I were still out in the newsroom at my reporter's desk, I would be baffled like a lot of my colleagues. So, so maybe he didn't. Uh, uh, explained to the staff uh, as as well as he should what he was doing, but he, he certainly had good reasoning and, and, and took time to tell me what he was doing. You know, any time any kind of an issue came up, he would give me kind of a pointer here and there about what, why he was doing what he was doing. And, and I don't recall anything specific, but, but I was impressed uh, by his day-to-day -day decision making. And uh, uh, Gene Roberts, uh, whom I worked with for 18 years at the Enquirer, uh, worked next door to him. He was the executive editor and I was the managing editor. Uh, always in the quiet moments, uh, we would try to explain that we, you know, our, our goal to be very honorable uh, and to do what is right and uh, uh, always, of course, serve the readers. 
there's, I mean, there's a lot more to be said, I'm sure, about covering um, you know, desegregation and civil yeah. rights in Arkansas in the, in the 50s. Um, but before, before we leave that topic behind, but one thing I was wondering is um, the business uh, pressures of the time, you know, that if you were running stories mm -hmm. that um, the business community uh, was not in agreement with, that that yeah. could hurt, you, hurt the paper financially, you know, did you ever notice that that played a role in it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and that's uh, good that you asked that question. Uh, the Arkansas Gazette, with Harry Ashmore as uh, our writer of the editorials, as the, as the editor of the paper, uh, uh, actually his title was executive editor. Mr. High School, John Netherland High School, who owned the paper, had the title of president and editor. Uh, but uh, Harry wrote the editorials, and Mr. High School uh, put his uh, fortune, a family fortune, on the line to do the right thing at that time. And so the uh, f front page editorial, which don't see much anymore, but uh, on the day that Fall was called out the guard and we reported that, along with the reporting was a front page editorial that said the crisis Mr. Fall was made. And it was a marvel of logic uh, and certainly a, a very prescient in saying what it said something along the lines that uh, that the federal government is going to carry out its court orders no matter what the cost to this community. And absolutely that happened in the next two years. Uh, and uh, it did not have to happen. And so Ashmore very eloquently and very in a very logical way explained why what Faubus was doing was morally wrong and was practically wrong. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the majority of the white people did not want desegregation at that time and were uh, uh, in sympathy with Faubus and, and I think they would have accepted the segregation with, without very much of an argument at all, but if the president, governor of the state says that we can get out of this, which Faubus of course privately knew he couldn't, uh, then they are encouraged uh, to, uh, to resist. Uh, and so our circulation, which had just hit 100,000 that summer, uh, plummeted to 80,000 in two weeks. And uh, I, I was always impressed that, and, and proud that I worked for a man who would be willing to take that, you know, to take that uh, risk uh, in, in uh, the consequences of making a morally correct decision. Were there any over um, threats from advertisers? The fire was uh, uh, in the trance issue when I came. Uh, it had been run by uh, uh, Walter Annenberg uh, for 30 years. Uh, his father, Mo Annenberg, uh, rescued the paper in the Depression. But uh, Mo was sent to a prison in about 1940 for uh, tax evasion. And Walter Annenberg then uh, uh, took over as, and ran the, the paper for 30 years. I think his genius was in uh, TV Guide, uh, which was very successful. That was his idea. And, uh, and he also published other magazines like Seventeen. I don't think he paid enough attention to the Inquirer, and he certainly used the Inquirer as a uh, political instrument that he, he was involved in, in, uh, in politics in, the, uh, in Pennsylvania and, and nationally, and, and he used the Inquirer uh, news coverage to, uh, to serve those purposes. Uh, that I think that uh, Milton Schaap, the governor of the state, uh, was one of his targets, and that resulted in a, in a story and headline in the Inquirer in which uh, the reporter asked Milton Schaap, have you, have you ever been in a mental institution? And Schaap said, well, no, I haven't. So the next day, a big headline says, Schaap denies being in medical <laughs> in mental institution. Uh, so that's the sort of journalism that was practiced. Uh, the Philadelphia Magazine in the, in the late 60s exposed the fact that uh, uh, Harry Carafin, who was the paper's leading uh, investigative reporter, was a very good investigative reporter, but didn't always publish what he found out. That when he would uh, uh, dig up something embarrassing or, or criminal about someone, he would go to that person and, and offer to be a consultant for a monthly retainer in lieu of publishing this, that he could be a public relations consultant and his problems would go away. If he didn't, uh, then he would find a story in the Inquirer about what, uh, so, uh, uh, after uh, that happened, uh, Carafin was sent to prison for extortion uh, in his great uh, embarrassment to, to the paper. 
but that was uh, kind of an outgrowth of, of the of the kind of way that the paper was run during the, that period. Now, would you say those things were typical of the time? Both the publisher kind of uh, pushing his own political agenda, well, and also uh, reporter. <laughs> I think that Mr. Annenberg went beyond what was normally done, but yes, uh, I do think that it was a different time, and editors like Harry Ashmore and and others uh, had behind the scenes involvement in the stories that their staff were covering, and uh, we know today that's not a good thing. Uh, uh, it's difficult for me to, to say to judge, don't want to judge uh, people of another era, but that was what was accepted at the time. Uh, but I, I think that uh, to the extent of really corrupting the, uh, the news coverage, uh, that certainly uh, uh, the Annenberg regime at the Enquirer uh, was, was, good, was not good. And, and that was a sort of, so uh, Knight Ritter bought the paper, or Knight newspaper, the predecessor of Knight Ritter, bought the paper January 1, 1970. Uh, Gene Roberts was its second editor, came in October 72, and I joined the paper in February 73. And we were dealing uh, with uh, uh, the residue of, of that era. And so uh, uh, definitely we needed to try to, to change the course. Now, we did have our own problem in 76 and 7 uh, when a reporter, same last name as mine but we're not related, Laura Foreman, was found to have uh, been involved in a romantic relationship with uh, Harry, uh, Buddy C. and Franny, uh, who was then uh, – a Pennsylvania state senator from Philadelphia, who was one of the leading political uh, forces in the state. She was covering politics, clearly a conflict of interest, which she had denied to Gene Roberts. But when, that, uh, uh, when the FBI investigated uh, Cianfrani, who was eventually sent to prison for, uh, on corruption charges, they found evidence of, of you know, multiple gifts to Laura, which you know, kind of prove the relationship. Uh, and so uh, that led to uh, Gene Roberts to say we need to uh, uh, write a, a conflict of interest code of ethics so that everybody understands what we stand for. Uh, that We now not only are trying to live down the reputation of the Annenberg Inquirer, which a lot of people are not aware there's been a change, but we got our own problem that we need to, uh, to try to overcome. So that, that was a, a, a period in which uh, I think that, that uh, certainly at the Enquirer, in, but in the newsrooms generally across the country, things were starting to change. So there had and uh, nowhere was this more marked than, than in the acceptance of guests from people that we covered, whether it be politicians or, or, uh, 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 or businesses. And, and I remember when I first started working at the Arkansas Gazette, uh, that the electric company, the Arkansas Power and Light, would give everybody in the newsroom a gift. And you could look around and see the guy who covered uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the State Public Service Commission would get uh, uh, a big uh, electric oven and other people would get a toaster or something. So there was a, there was a pecking order. And I asked people, what, what about this? And they said, oh, this is just part of the business. Uh, we don't get paid very much. And so free, free admissions and, and gifts are, are just part of the, the trade. And, and the, uh, uh, the racetrack, Oaklawn at Hot Springs, would throw a big party every year for the press, which is kind of the big social event of the year. Uh, and nobody thought a lot about that. So here's a softball question. What's the problem? What was the problem? Ethically. Uh, Oh, oh, the problem, yeah. Uh, well, they would cover these people, and they were taking gifts from them, so it would appear to the public, that if they became aware of the gifts, which you had to assume they were, uh, that we had uh, a debt to them, and that, that would not likely would be paid in the way we covered the news. Uh, it's called an appearance of conflict of interest, that, we don't, that maybe we didn't, uh, and that's what the reporters would tell me, the older reporters, is that, Look, I'm not going to be uh, going to be bought out for a toaster, uh, but I'll take the toaster and I'm going to cover him just the way I would anyway. I know that I'm honest, and but uh, the, what we realized is we started thinking about it, and I think that was the key: is you really started thinking about it. And I think that our generation it became editors, say in the '70s, uh, and we had the Hutchins Commission's uh, 
uh, recommendations on the social responsibility of the press uh, issued in 1947 uh, that I think it had some effect even though the, the uh, at least on the surface the uh, editors rejected that, that but I think it did make an impression and as we uh, you know, as we went along, and, and the uh, older people, the people who told me about it's okay to take a poster, retired and moved on, and, and replaced by even younger journalists. I think that uh, that that uh, things changed by evolution, but it, it really did have a marked change. The, the the evolution sped up in the 70s. So, in drafting a code of ethics for the Enquirer, um, could you talk about what that process yeah, was? Yeah. Who actually was involved, and how mm -hmm. you came up with? Yes, yeah, so Gene asked me to, to make sure it got done, which is kind of the way things a managing editor would do. Uh, and we also discussed that it ought to be a, a staff uh, committee. That we And I, I would say to this day, and, uh, is, uh, and I try to point this out to, to uh, aspiring journalists in my book, is that, that uh, an awareness in, in, in thinking about uh, journalism ethics uh, comes not just from the newsroom leaders, although they're certainly important, but from the rank and file. Uh, that uh, that peer pressure to do the right thing is probably more effective than us saying here's here's the guideline for or the rule for the newsroom as the managing editor. Uh, so we wanted to, to we were aware that very strong feeling uh, in the newsroom about what had happened, say in the Laura Foreman case. They felt. That they had been tarnished by this, in uh, as much as the newspaper's name, that they individually had suffered uh, a, a loss of credibility, a loss of uh, professional uh, self-esteem because of that. So we got staff members involved, and John, uh, Jim Naughton became the uh, kind of the scribe who would take, we'd have meetings and and uh, talk about it, and Jim would then kind of codify and, and issue. A, uh, proposed guidelines that we'd all then discuss again. Uh, and, uh, and my part was to try to survey what was out there. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And, and I think when you ever do something like this, you try to take advantage of what someone else has already done. Uh, and so I called a bunch of newspapers, called the ASNE and APME, and tried to find out uh, what newspapers had. And then how do you... Once you have this code, how do you make it sort of uh, um, work in the day-to-day -day life of the newsroom? Because mm -hmm. I, I remember reading an article once where, um, uh, you know, journalists were asked um, about their their paper's code of ethics, and uh, and they would say things like, "Oh yeah, I think we've got one around mm -hmm. here somewhere." Let me, you know, and they were rummaging around in a drawer. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing to develop a code of ethics, or yeah. another to actually. There's, well, there's two issues. One, you know, what do you do if somebody violates it? So there's the enforcement yeah. of an issue. And then the other is just the sort of the awareness and ongoing yeah. sort of uh, training of reporters. Well, uh, that, that's a very good question. And, uh, and I think that we did recognize that it's not going to do any good if it sits in an office drawer and, and is ignored, uh, that it would defeat the purpose of what we were trying to do. Uh, and uh, we of course, have a guild uh, union in the newsroom. Uh, and in that time, the uh, policy of the National Labor Relations Board on, uh, on news, newsroom codes of ethics was not fully formed. As a matter of fact, during that period, the, uh, uh, the Madison State, uh, the Madison newspaper in Wisconsin uh, issued uh, a comprehensive uh, guideline on on freebies uh, and say that we're not going to accept free tickets, we're not going to do the sort of thing that today is uh, is is a given. Uh, but the union took them to the NLRB, unfair labor practice, that you have to bargain this. And uh, a, an administrative judge agreed initially with the union saying that uh, you're taking compensation away from them, saying they couldn't take free tickets. Uh, and you do have to bargain. The NLRB eventually then, in the 70s, did uh, set aside that ruling and said that, yes, you can write your own code of ethics, uh, but you can enforce them like you, other work rules that are in the contract. Uh, and we were fine with that. Uh, we wanted not to have our principles watered down in the, in the labor bargaining process. 
uh, and we were willing to deal with it uh, without the, the teeth of a, of a work rule that could be enforced on the contract. So two things immediately brought uh, home to the staff that we had a code of ethics. Uh, one was that uh, uh, the book editor was found to have uh, been sending review copies to the Strand Bookstore in New York for, to be resold, and he would then get, pocket the money from, from the review books that had been sent to him. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, he had uh, been a part of the committee that had written the code and provided the language that uh, review books may not be sold under any circumstances. The APME uh, was doing a, a study and, they, and uh, some editor got a, uh, a staff member hired by the Strand Bookstore who made notes on, on which uh, book editors were sending books in and, and our guy was, was one of them. So uh, we couldn't uh, fire him under the, because, uh, for violating the code of ethics because it didn't have the standing of a contractual work room. Uh, but we removed him as a book editor, and he eventually, you know, fairly soon left the paper. Uh, then uh, the uh, nightlife columnist uh, was found to be going into business, establishing a, 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 a something that would be covered by his nightlife column, and would be in partnership with someone that, by our count, uh, going back in the archives, uh, had been mentioned favorably 56 times in the last year. So Gene Roberts told him, uh, you can't have, go into this business and continue to be our nightlife columnist. And he said, well, I'm going to go into this business. And Gene said, you're no longer our nightlife columnist. And then he soon left the paper. We didn't go out and advertise it. Uh, everybody in the newsroom knew about it. So they knew that we now had a code and it meant something. And as we went on orientation, uh, we give them not only, uh, I would send them a copy when they were hired, and then when they come to, to work, we would try to have a, a uh, uh, groups of staffers who had come over a period of three to six months would gather for a day and, and one of the sessions would be on talking about uh, the, uh, the conflict of interest codes and I would you know, give them about 20 uh, hypothetical situations and then we'd talk about how the code would apply to it. So it was, it was uh, as new people came in, they, they got some, some kind of formal uh, indoctrination on the code. So you were managing editor of the Inquirer during some pretty turbulent times in yeah. Philadelphia. Um, can you think of any, you know, you know, thorny ethics issues that came up um, in, in the coverage of the city or the world beyond the city um, during your tenure there? You, know, you really had to make some tough decisions. Having to give up the child that they had bonded with and so forth, and uh, I mean, there's, I don't see heroes and villains in this thing because. Uh, I think that the, the birth mother had a legal right to ask for the baby back, but it, but it was also, but it clearly was an emotional problem. Well, our reporter apparently had arrived uh, for a news conference on the, when this story began, uh, and uh, not a good idea, but uh, they said, okay, then everything is agreed. Well, he had not heard everything, but he agreed. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, as, so we've reported this childless couple now is going to lose the baby, and, and uh, this story went on for some time. And we just, another reporter covered it, and, and uh, uh, this reporter asked, what is this three-year-old child doing in, in, in the house? And they said, and the other reporter said, well, that's the re child we're not supposed to report. That the, uh, apparently the deal was, which it's certainly question, ethnically question, wrong was that they had accepted that they would not mention the other child in, a, in return for getting access to the couple. And uh, of course our reporter, you go, turn the clock back, should have said, well, what are the guidelines because I missed them? And they would have said, absolutely not, I'm not accepting that. And they would have been ejected and we wouldn't have had access, but we certainly could have covered the story and, and, and reported it correctly all along. But our reporter was had been considered having given the, the people his word that, that he would not report on the, and we were saying well, we're not going to continue lying to our our, uh, our audience uh, that that they're a childless couple uh, and it wasn't explained very well by us in the paper why we had done this which I think is another thing we've learned about ethics is that you need to be transparent you need to try to explain everything and we just said that we had discovered this and that we were now reporting it 
and it, which led some people to write letters to the editor saying, well, what is there? Is rule you can only have one child or something like this? What difference does it make? And they missed the point. The difference was not whether you can have one child or two or ten, but do we tell you the truth, you, the reader is the truth? And that meant having to uh, renege on, on a, a promise that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a, an ill-considered promise that, that our agent had made. Uh, so that's the kind of things that, that come up. Uh, uh, and I think that it, with the benefit of the kind of training that we're trying to give our students now, uh, that even though I've been in the business a good time, while I, I could have handled it a lot better. And I think the main thing there would have been to, uh, to tell the, the audience specifically why we thought it was important that we report this now, that we were not concerned about the number of children, but rather the, the truth of what we were reporting. At what point did you see reporters starting to come in, you know, young reporters just out of school who now had ethics training uh, as students? I don't know that I know which ones did and which one didn't, but I think that uh, the, the education level was continuing to uh, to rise. Uh, that uh, when I went in the business, 50% uh, of the reporters did not have uh, college degrees, and uh, now any survey and say in daily newspapers show that well over 90%, and probably anybody coming in the last 20 years has go has got a college degree. Uh, it, uh, I, so I, I think the education level has risen, and a lot of them uh, probably did have some ethics training, but I'm not sure that I can say which ones did and which ones didn't. I, I feel good about the people we, at the paper, and I think that irrespective of their educational background, they, they almost, innate, I would even innately uh, understood the importance of ethics. I say innately, but I, I think that we were innate too, but, but we benefited from what we learned in the last 50 years, and, and we learned from, as we went along, if we, if we made a mistake, uh, I think that one thing I contributed uh, to the dialogue there in the newsroom was, let's figure out why, if we had to do over again, or if a similar situation presented itself in the future, what could we do to have a better outcome? And I think that sort of post-mortems is very helpful and useful. And we would do that uh, whether it happened to us or whether it happened to another newspaper. I remember uh, Janet Cook's story about Jimmy, the eight-year-old heroin addict, uh, was an unnamed, what I call an unnamed principle or subject of a story. It went even beyond an unnamed report, uh, source, uh, which we knew enough then that, that uh, the public did not like anonymous sources. We think that there sometimes we've got to give information that anonymous sources uh, can, can only provide. But the misuse of anonymous sources uh, or the abuse or excessive use of it is a problem. Yeah, I, I, uh, I have a chapter in the book, uh, the, uh, my uh, short name for it is love and hate chapter, is they love what we give them. They, deep down, I think they do accept the news that we give them by and large, even though they may tell a surveyor that I don't believe anything that the newspaper, but they read it every day, or, and uh, they certainly blog about it or, or, or talk, talk radio about the lying newspapers, but this is where they get their information. Uh, so I think that there, uh, I, I'm not, I can't ex really explain why there is this antipathy toward uh, journalists. Uh, uh, certainly the, the Gallup poll, which rates the ethics, uh, perception of ethics and the different perception, puts us about middle way, uh, you know, ahead of, say, of used car salesmen and congressmen, but well behind nurses and teachers. Uh, in my view, that uh, we ought to be near the top because we, we have very good uh, standards in which the public doesn't seem to know much about. And I think maybe we do, ought to do a better job of telling them what our standards are. But uh, if, you know, if, uh, if uh, Anthony Scalia, the Supreme Court Justice, can go hunting with somebody who's then going to have a case before the United States Supreme Court and he sees nothing wrong with this, well, we know if our reporter went hunting with somebody who's going to write a story about uh, that it's very crucial that it be uh, impartial and everything, that that's, that's wrong. Uh, that we have higher standards on conflict of interest than, than most judges do. 
and and they have the ability to make rulings that have the ability, you know, that have the uh, teeth of the law, and all we can do is uh, try to tell the public what's going on. So uh, uh, I I can't really ex explain this, but I I think they do perceive that we're arrogant, uh, and uh, sometimes we uh, give them ammunition for for that. Uh, what I say is that uh, what we should do in, in in journalism is to always try to do the right thing, never deliberately make a decision that would justify this kind of criticism, but also recognize that we're not going to be popular, that we ought to be true to our code, uh, true to our being accurate, fair, and uh, be in our recognize our responsibility to respect the audience and respond to their questions but also recognize that sometimes they had to tell them that we were right and here's why we made the decision we did. So we either correct if we're wrong, if the public points out we're wrong, it's a correct and reform, and, uh, but if we are right and our rechecking of it, of the story's facts shows that we had it right the first time, is to say this is the way we did it and, and to explain our decision. Um, I, uh, that's what we talk about, being accountable, that you and I teach in the classroom, is to respect the audience and tell the audience either uh, we're, what we got wrong and here's what's right, or we think we had it right and here's why we did it that way. The Daily News Summary is sponsored by a bank and has uh, the bank's ad on it, and, it has, and the whole thing is done outlined in the color trademark color of the bank. Uh, it's a lead, more problematical a, a business column on the front of the business section is sponsored by a bank. Uh, several te television radio stations have uh, sole naming rights to their newsrooms. Uh, a television station uh, uh, in Nevada uh, has uh, product placement on their, new, on their uh, news and feature interview sessions where they have uh, McDonald's coffee uh, cups on the, in front of the uh, anchors and interviewers. Uh, 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 there have been television programs that are, have all appear to be like uh, Today or Good Morning America. They're done locally, uh, but they, the difference is that some of the uh, people are, being, are paying them to be interviewed on their program and talk about, and talk about their uh, uh, products. Uh, without, uh, in my view, proper uh, n notification of the audience, which is ought to be crystal clear what's an ad and what's a news story or what's entertainment. So I think that the, the, in the area of, uh, uh, of advertising, uh, uh, which is, flows from the necessity to try to make ends meet, uh, has led to what I think are some questionable decisions. And, this, this is not so much the newsroom as it is the news organization altogether. You also can have video uh, as television does and, and certainly audio the way radio does. And all of this is interactive and it's on demand. And they have everything except, uh, I guess, portability. And I guess we're, we're, uh, in some areas we're coming to that with handheld devices. Uh, whether that gives you the satisfaction, say, of reading a newspaper or sitting in an easy chair uh, and reading something uh, on a handheld uh, device, uh, to me th that doesn't seem to equate, but, but maybe to a, a, a younger generation that was brought up on electronics, uh, that's fine. Uh, so I think that uh, we're trending in that direction. But what concerns me is that, I th that while there are a lot of very good thinkers out there, and I'm thinking of people like Kenzie Wilson, who uh, just left USA Today, is uh, running its website now is at NPR, uh, a very thoughtful person, uh, and there are others. Ken Sands now at Congressional Quarterly. The, I can Fred Mann, who I worked with at the Enquirer, and we ran our website for its first ten years. That I, I really enjoy and always have all my life enjoy a very thoughtful letters to the editor column, whether it's a magazine or, in which I know that uh, that they're going to be tightly edited, that everybody will have a thoughtful position, whether it's something I agree with or not, and I welcome that diversity of opinion. But what I see, I, I just cannot uh, adapt to a vulgar and, and mean-spirited uh, posting. But I think they've got to solve the problems that, uh, like the ones I've just mentioned, and I don't see them pro so being solved now. Standards are being set without a lot of thought being given that we are creating a template for the future of journalism, which are going to continue ad infinitum. 
uh, but also we're trying to teach you how to make good decisions. And while you're informed by what the uh, prevailing standards are in the profession, you're not bound to them. And if you can come up with better solutions, then I want you to do that. And particularly, you have to solve the problems of the Internet that I don't think are solved today.